I grew up in Bedfordshire uh, and I, I came to classical music, I think, sort of quite late. Um, I started playing the trumpet at sort of 14 um, and uh, within about three years or so I, I got to grade eight. Um, and uh, my first performing experiences were in a choir run by um, Michael Baxter, who sadly passed away a few years ago, um, a phenomenal you know, musician and, and music teacher um, at St. Thomas More in Bedford. Um, and then, uh, you know, a little bit later, I ended up playing in sort of youth orchestras and concert bands and brass bands and singing in youth opera. Um, and shortly after I started playing the trumpet, I took up the piano. Um, and uh, it's funny, singing, you know, in those choirs, um, you know, my very first sort of interaction with performing music I had, you know, a profound, you know, transformative experience singing in those school choirs, uh, and I knew, I knew at that point I wanted to be a musician. Um, you know, I wanted to immerse myself in that sort of magical experience as, as often as possible. Um, and uh, within a few weeks of taking up the trumpet, um, I wrote my uh, first piece. Uh, which was a duet for a uh, French horn and trumpet. Um, uh, yeah, it wasn't very good. Um, I, I think it was a theme and variations based on um, the German tune. Um, I think that was what it, what it was called. Um, you know, sort of one of those kind of simple melodies that, you know, often appear in this sort of early instrumental like brass books, you know. Um, and I remember my mum got me uh, a tape from uh, the local jumble sale um, and it was like a green and white tape which I, I still have called, uh, had the unfortunate name of being called An Evening with Tchaikovsky um, and uh, the, the, the tape had I think parts of Tchaikovsky Fifth Symphony and part of Tchaikovsky Six um, and you know I spent hours in my room conducting it um, and so by the time I was 15, I could conduct symphonies one to six in my room and the Manfred Symphony from memory. I think it's, it's sort of important, uh, you know, reflecting on some of those formative experiences. It's... Um, you know, interesting looking at like some of the challenges faced by music education today. Um, you know, I'm a minority, I'm from a working class background, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and I feel genuinely fortunate to have had those opportunities. Um, and I know that today, in certain parts of the country, that isn't always the case. Um, and I think that, that a, a point that was raised uh, during my documentary, um, which was raised by I think composer Daniel Kadane and uh, Chichi Wanoku, um, was the intersect between BME representation and class. Um, they are two different things, but there is an overlap. Uh, and uh, having sort of had all of those uh, experiences, uh, I know how important it is for us to ensure that you know future generations benefit from those same opportunities, um, and it's important, like not just because it's a nice thing to do. Uh, you know, it's it's I think important for the future of the industry. I I think one of the things that interests me is drawing um, drawing from outside of classical music, um, so drawing from whether it's the African diaspora or popular music forms, you know, or traditions outside of sort of Western classical music and, you know, bringing that in and making a musical cocktail. Um, and I, I think that that probably comes from uh, thinking of myself as a sort of a bit of a cultural uh, sex on the beach or mojito. Um, and so I, I think I'm sort of at my most authentic when I'm able to do that. Um, I often sort of describe it as like putting things together that don't necessarily belong together. Um, and I, I think sort of even as I say that, you know, reflecting on you know my own uh, 
uh, cultural identity. That's a sort of somewhat unfortunate choice of words. Um, but, but I do think that when you are of dual heritage, you certainly I feel as if I'm sort of like an embodiment of, of all of those things. And so um, I'm sort of keen that, that that is reflected in, you know, some of the music that I write. Um, but I also think it's sort of more about, you know, tapping into that kind of childlike mindset. Um, as a kid, I used to cut out pictures of, you know, people, of models from, you know, my mum's catalogue uh, and sort of make them interact with, you know, characters from magazines or comic books or, you know, characters that I'd drawn. And I'd sort of stick them all together on a page and, you know, create these kind of sort of collages. Uh, and um, I, I, don't, I don't think I've stopped doing that. Um, Last year, I wrote a piece for um, the Hindustani vocalist Truti Jauhari um, and, uh, and a new music ensemble um, because I wanted to see how those two different traditions would interact. Um, and the year before that, uh, I wrote music for a theatre production uh, of Euripides' Bacchae uh, in ancient Greek. Um, and so I wanted to see what would happen if I got the actors to rap in ancient Greek, um, if there could be some sort of <coughs> integration between, I don't know, a sort of hip hop element. It's not always about fusing uh, of cultural musical traditions, but you know, that sort of like, I don't know, Heston Blumenthal practice of combining ingredients, which at first seemed quite different, and being faced with the challenge of sort of finding ways to get them to complement each other. Do I like having my music performed? Um, no, um, like the actual performance itself, no, um, particularly if it's a, if it's a first performance, um, and, and I, whenever people ask me this, they're, they're, they're always surprised, I think, by my answer, because the assumption is, um, you know, that the performance itself sort of represents the apex of the whole process. Um, and you know, it's a, certainly composing sometimes does feel like climbing a mountain. So you sort of understand, you know, why people might feel that way or think that. Um, but for me, it's never really been the case. Um, the high point for me is usually the moment during composing, um, that where you know the ideas sort of begin to kind of take on a, a life of their own, and you sort of begin to understand. The personality of the music that you're writing. Um, a, a first performance is usually something that I tend to endure rather than enjoy. Um, uh, and I, I mean, I suppose that with repeat performances of works, um, especially those written a long time ago, it, it is a, a, a less painful, much more pleasurable experience because it, it's almost as if um, because so much time has passed, um, that it, you know someone else could have written it uh, and you can sort of detach yourself from uh, you know the music and uh, the memory of composing it and appreciate it in the same way that a general audience would um, I, and I think that that might have something to do with me being a little bit of a, a control freak um, because in performances um, you know you're sort of completely powerless to do anything 
like during the performance, about the performance, assuming that you're not playing the work yourself. Um, honestly, I think, uh, uh, I don't think that I'm alone uh, in this as a composer, um, but it's, it's completely understandable to me why composers would feel somewhat reluctant to admit this because ultimately, you know, you want to get your music out there and you want to share your ideas and you want to communicate that. Um, so uh, I think the thing that, that I do enjoy about having a piece performed um, is, is the rehearsals actually, is working with other musicians who are as passionate about their discipline as I am about mine, but in a completely different way. Um, and and I think that that serves me, the composer, in a number of ways. Um, you know, working with uh, other musicians, and and I think this is particularly the case if you're working with. Um, a sort of smaller ensemble, um, you know, can be really inspiring either in terms of providing like a sort of renewed incentive to sort of carry on with the piece, uh, if, uh, assuming that it's a work in progress, or that you take that inspiration, you know, what you've gained from that amazing interaction and carry that over into the next piece. Uh -huh. Yes, yes. yes. Whatever is so difficult. This is just ridiculous, actually. Oh, just that. Just that. <laughs> <laughs> just that. The rest is fine. <laughs> um, but I know that's because I think composing can be a very isolating activity, um, and so performances are sort of essential to the composer's own well-being because it motivates them to sort of get out into the world and you know interact with uh, other human beings. Um, and, you know, this is sort of one of the, the many reasons why I wanted to, one of the many benefits um, of, of making a documentary, because, um, you know, you, you really do have the excuse to engage with other composers on a creative project in the same way that you would do with, uh, with performers. during the making of the, the documentary, funnily enough, almost all of them said rhythm. Uh, and I think balance and uh, attention to dynamics sort of coming a close second. Um, and I'm totally on board with that. I get that. Um, but for me, tempo actually is usually the thing. Um, and, and I was thinking about this and I sort of wondered whether um, since the advent of sequencing software and you know the, the various tools used by composers to hear their music played back, whether um, that has sort of served to kind of exacerbate my sensitivity towards tempo. Um, but the more I, th I thought about it, I think even before then, it was something that I, I myself was sensitive to. I, th I think also that, that within contemporary classical music, sometimes there, there is a sort of particular approach to performing certain kinds of repertoire, um, at, which I think has led to a little bit of a conservatism um, or a, at least a sort of a cautiousness in the face of music that demands, I don't know, something that's you know, passionate or expressive. Um, and uh, I think rather than performers being sort of absolutely attentive in their, you know, accuracy of dynamics, you know, velocity of volume, whatever, um, it, it's more important for me that they understand expression in relation to the musical phrase, um, that they understand the language. Um, uh, I do think that a lot of uh, new music scores use too many dynamic markings. Um, and, 
myself included in that actually um and yeah you know of course there are there are some exceptions you know if there's for instance a total sort of serial component you know um you know like in i don't know messian's mode de valeurs non intensité uh or, or boulez's uh, livre pour quatre um the the dynamic markings in those pieces are you know they're part of the sort of structural fabric of the composition um my former teacher one of my former teachers steve marland um he, he always said that um composers who were obsessed with you know marking kind of every single note that that was often a sign that they were insecure about the material that they'd actually written um and so to compensate they would clutter the score with superfluous information which ultimately serves to create a barrier between the performer and your music um you know if they're forced to be so attentive to a different dynamic you know every other note or every other bar it sort of makes it much harder actually for them to you know contribute their own voice to the conversation or at least feel that they have kind of permission to do so um you know because you've sort of left little room for them to kind of add their own stamp um and so when i finish a score now i uh I, I do sort of go back and, you know, remove some of the dynamic markings. Um, you know, if you look through Bach Partita's, um, you know, for instance, you'll see that there are hardly any dynamic markings. And yet, within a single performance, there is just so much freedom, you know, so much diversity of colour, so much diversity of expression, etc. Uh, you know, in a single performance uh, and also between different interpretations. Um, I think, you know, obviously as composers, you know, we want, you know, the notes played right, you know, we, we wrote them for a reason uh, and, you know, we do notice when they're wrong, or at least I do. Uh, um, but I would happily forego an accurate but slightly dull performance for a performance that has some wrong notes but has a real you know, energy, you know, and is able to bring out some of the gestural and expressive intentions within the music. Um, there's nothing worse, actually, than a sort of an accurate yet slightly lacklustre performance.
when I'm writing, am I concerned about the audience? I think when I was younger, I used to be. Um, and, you know, I, I may have even practiced bowing after uh, an imagined performance that brought the house down. Uh, you, know, it's, you know, it's like when you're in the shower and uh, you accept, like, the Academy Award for Best New Artist. Um, it, I, I was always aware um, of... Uh, an attitude amongst my contemporaries that writing for an audience was something to be frowned upon. Um, weirdly, nowadays, I, I think very little about the audience and uh, I find that I'm much more preoccupied with the performers, uh, assuming that those two things are different. Um, you know, obviously, you know, of course, what you create, you know, should be something that performers are able to play. Um, but I do think there's a pressure on composers to write something that they believe performers will be able to play with relative ease. Uh, and the implication to that is, you know, that because of that, they would want to, to play, play it more than once. Um, you know, that's an assumption right there. Um, and I, th I think that definitely um, that idea has the, the the potential to curtail one's sort of creative choices um, to the detriment of the music um, and in a way weirdly I think I had it right when I was younger because uh, I couldn't care less about the performers I was only concerned about the audience um, but the audience of course was always a kind of a, a fiction it was like a sort of a, a, an imagined audience um, that, that was just you know an imagined phenomenon. Um, you know, they were never real. Um, the, the, the performers that you write for are real, and I, I think in a way, um, it, it's better to write sort of faithfully for one's imagined audience than it is to be overly concerned about whether your players like what you've written. Um, you know, because you have no real control over that anyway. <laughs>